Hello, it's a great honor to be doing this piano talk. Thank you so much to Bill Rudiak for making this all possible with his fabulous Fazioli and for recording this piano talk. And thanks very much to the Ross McKee Foundation. I'm so grateful and I just wish that we could all be together in person and I could hear your thoughts today about uh, this whole topic. I'm going to talk about music by women and why sh we should all be including these composers in our concert programs. So that is the focus today. And I hasten to say that we don't have to get rid of Beethoven and it doesn't mean that Mozart isn't so great after all, but we do need to be more inclusive and to think beyond the repertoire that uh, that we're always given. And that takes a little bit of thought and work and effort and research. I want to focus on classical works, classical and romantic works, because the new music world is more equitable and female composers are more visible in the 20th century and the present day. So let's focus on the classical repertoire. It's difficult to work against generations of accepted behavior and uh, behavior that's, that's given to us, but it can also be liberating. And again, this is about adding new repertoire and new voices and expanding our horizons rather than limiting ourselves. So it's really about being inclusive. So let's think about some of the reasons why classical pianists don't perform music by women that often. I've done some traveling around the country, visiting colleges and conservatories, and one thing students often say is, my teachers never assigned me works by women and I never heard anyone play them. And that's so true of pretty much all of us. We see these charts of great composers. There are the really great ones and the less great ones and the okay ones and the really lesser ones. And it's drilled into us that they are all men and they are all white men. Here's how tall were the great composers. So this is an example. It's like all the relative heights of the great composers through history. Uh, it's, it's an interesting chart, but they all look pretty much the same. So um, it's understandable to perform the music you grew up with and to accept that there must be some good reason why we play Vincent Persichetti and not Ruth Crawford or lots of Poulenc, but not Germaine Taifer, another member of Les Cis, Katja Turian and not Nina Makarova, who is pretty much unheard of. Her wonderful etudes still remain unplayed. But then it's up to each of us to consciously think to ourselves, what do I want to do as a musician or as a teacher? Do I want to advocate for some really extraordinary composers who haven't gotten the attention they deserve? For instance, take the example of Elizabeth Jacquet de la Guerre, born in 1665 in Paris, prodigious talent, brilliant harpsichordist as well as composer. She composed opera, ballet, chamber music, vocal music, and at least six keyboard suites. So just imagine a world in which we don't talk about French Baroque keyboard composers like Couperin and Rameau and others. And then, oh, by the way, there was a woman who was a pioneer in keyboard suites. She's over there. The French Baroque composers are over here. Here's Elizabeth Jacquet de la Guerre, but imagine if we integrate her into the mix and really give her her rightful place in music history. So I'm going to play four movements of the Suite in D minor by Elizabeth Jacquet de la Guerre. And I'm leaving out several uh, important movements, but for the sake of time, um, we'll hear the prelude, the Saraban, Chacon l'inconstant, and it means inconstant, Chacon, and so sort of 
uh, moving between major and minor in interesting ways, and then the gigue. Here's the Sarabande. I won't take the repeats. I just want to show you how beautiful it is. Len Constant.
is the G. So there's an example of some Elizabeth Jacquet de la Guerre, and I encourage you to look at, uh, well, I am SLP has all of her uh, keyboard suites, both, I think the original, I don't know if they're the manuscripts, but um, an early, very early edition, as well as sort of a, a put into easier to read. Um, Print. So, uh, Elizabeth Chaquet de la Guerre. And I wonder, what if we lived in a world in which Andras Schiff, when he went on tour, played just one piece by a woman? What if Marie Pariah, Marta Argerich, Igor Levitt, Lang Lang, Jeremy Denk, Angela Hewitt, Richard Good? Mitsuko Uchida, Daniel Trifonov, Yu Jo Wang, Jonathan Biss. What if any one of them played just one work by a woman, just one composition written by a woman? Just think what a tectonic shift that would be. So even if we can't wait for that to happen, we can all begin in our own way. Another argument I hear even now is that women just aren't as good composers as men. Uh, I still hear that today. Whether it's that they lacked education or opportunity or are somehow just missing the composer gene. So this reminds me of a letter that Florence Price wrote to Serge Kusevitsky where she says, unfortunately, the work of women composers is preconceived by many to be light, frothy, lacking in depth, logic, and virility. She says, I ask no concessions because of race or sex and am willing to abide by a decision based solely on the worth of my work. So she's just asking him to look at her scores and listen without judging beforehand. And that to me is a very important reminder. We have to listen without letting our preconceptions and biases get in the way. And I know I have them, you have them, we all have those sorts of implicit biases. But if, if Serge Kusevitsky had just heard this, had just heard this music, for instance, uh, um, If 
he had just heard that, would he have thought that's the work of a woman, it's light and frothy and lacking in depth, logic and virility? I don't think so. Uh, that's just a tiny passage from her, from Florence Price's Sonata in E minor, which is a, a beautiful piece. So um, this brings up the Mendelssohn family, two gifted young composers, Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn, and one is encouraged to be a composer, and the other is told that she should manage the household and have children, and she can dabble in composing, but publishing would be unladylike. Her own brother said of her, from my knowledge of Fanny, I should say that she has neither inclination nor vocation for authorship. She is too much all that a woman ought to be for this. She regulates her house and neither thinks of the public nor of the musical world, nor even of music at all until her duties, her, until her first duties are fulfilled. Publishing would only disturb her in these and I cannot say that I approve of it. But of course there is the famous story of Felix Mendelssohn taking his songs to Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace and she chooses her favorite to sing and they actually turn out to be by Fanny Mendelssohn. I'd like to do an experiment with blind listening. I had a great English teacher at Berkeley High School named Mr. Kennedy who would give us two sonnets, one by Shakespeare and one by a lesser Elizabethan composed uh, Elizabethan poet, and he would cover their names. So we couldn't think, oh, that's Shakespeare, and so that has to be much better. And we would have to make a persuasive case just based on the sonnet itself, which one was better. So now we'll do the same thing with the opening bars of two Mendelssohn pieces, one by Fanny Mendelssohn, one by Felix Mendelssohn, and you tell me which is which and which one is better. And I know it's unfair to do this based on just a few measures, but uh, let's give it a try. So I wonder if you could tell me, unless you know those pieces well, which one is by Felix Mendelssohn and which is by Fanny Mendelssohn. I think this is really good practice and something we might do with students because we all, as I say, have these hidden biases. So as I mentioned, uh, students um, and I talk the students that I talk to at conservatories and colleges say that their teachers dictate their repertoire and that perpetuates the same cycle of the established canon. Um, and I would like to play the piece by, uh, by Fanny Mendelssohn now, which is Song for the Piano, Opus 8, number one.
That's Fanny Mendelssohn. And um, so I was saying about uh, students talking about how their teachers dictate their repertoire and, uh, and they accept that established canon. And the problem is that then the cycle continues and students go on to become um, musicians and teachers and teach and perform that same repertoire that they're given. Uh, and one young man I met, a freshman, said to me, well, Clara Schumann and Fanny Mendelssohn were only famous because of the men that they were connected to, because they were connected to famous men. And I said, no, that in fact, I think that their reputations really suffered because they were overshadowed by those men. So I think these are all really valuable conversations to have and uh, introducing those, those topics because it's, it's time to do it. Um, another argument I hear often is when conductors and pianists and musicians are putting together a season, they often say, I just want to perform great music and not worry about gender and race. Uh, music is universal. It transcends those sorts of um, issues and it's not about identity politics. But the result, as we know over and over, is that we have yet another season of all male, all white male composers because those conductors and pianists and musicians prefer, and chamber ensembles, prefer to look no further than the accepted canon. And uh, there are season announcements coming out now, and I, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. It's 2020, and it's uh, we look at these season announcements. It's like, are you not seeing this? Are you, are you not seeing that you are, you know, we don't live in that, in that world anymore. Um, it doesn't reflect the world that we live in. So we're going to end with the 20th century uh, because also I see, um, you know, students entering competitions. And um, again, it's the same pieces each time, these sort of virtuosic competition pieces, all by men. And I thought this would be an interesting piece. 2011, it was written by Gabriela Ortiz, Mexican composer. Um, she has an incredible body of music. And, uh, you know, this would just be a great piece for pianists to consider, students to consider when they're entering competitions or just um, to get to know her music. She has several of these preludes and etudes, and this is number three by Gabriela Ortiz.
So that's Gabriela Ortiz, uh, the etude from the Prelude and Etude Number no. 3 from 2011. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you again to the Ross McKee Foundation and to Bill Rudiak. And um, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>